No rain today. No rain today. You still do a lot of walking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been walking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good rain Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know one of his friends put a roof on it. Oh, yeah. He'll yeah. 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 be back. Thank you. Let's go ahead and stand and sing, I Stand Amazed. <laughs>
Indians. And he can ring the bell. By way of announcements, church board members, get your homework into Ella today. So you had an assignment at board meeting a couple months ago. Those packets of homework are due today. So, board members, this is your last warning. Oh. <laughs> if you don't see Ella, put, in your, put it on your mailbox in the floor. Yeah. She said put it in the mailbox. She told me to say. Okay. So, you might get a little grace. You can put it in there later today if you bring it this morning. Uh, also, family camp is coming up in two weeks. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Oh, actually, <laughs> Melinda's going to send it. Okay, pass it around. So when it gets to you, sign up, and then pass it to the next person. When it gets to the back, start it on the back on that side. Send it to the front. Jerry, can I say something? Absolutely. We're, we're passing it around because um, even, uh, well, we would love for all of you to come for all of it, even if it's just like a Saturday afternoon or uh, Friday evening. But we're passing it around for everybody that's planning to attend our church service out there, which is at 11 o'clock at the Methodist camp, since there's no service here. Um, there's a free lunch afterwards for everyone. We're trying to figure out how many people to cook for. So if you're just planning to come just for the service on Sunday, if you could just write your name down, and then at the very end, the, the far right, just check just Sunday. So that we know how many people to plan for. So thank you. All righty. Um, you just took the next announcement. There will be no service here on the 11th. Um, it will be at the Methodist camp. So meet yeah. out there at the Fellowship Hall, the Methodist camp on that Sunday, two weeks from today. Um, also, next Sunday is our monthly collection for donations for Love Bank for food donations. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. And so let you remember to do that bring that next Sunday. I think that's it for announcements. Did I miss anything, Fred? Okay. So you said no. That's good. Join me if you would in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love to come to your house to celebrate your goodness your love, your grace, and who you are, to join with fellow believers in fellowship. And Lord, we come and glorify you this day. So Lord, we ask that you would be exalted and glorified and lifted up and pleased with the praise of your people. For Lord, we do love you. That's why we come. That's why we gather. Because we want to honor you, to worship you, and to hear your voice. So Lord, speak to us through every facet of this service this morning, in the prayer time, in the songs, and in the spoken word, and in the scripture. Lord, we want to be glorifying you. So Lord, meet with us and conform us to your image as we obey. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Just a thing on the Methodist camp, if anybody does not know where that's at, you head out, what's called out the road, and it's you pass um, Eagle River Bridge and then Herbert River Bridge, and then you take the next right. And if you hit Eagle Beach, not too far. Not too far. That's right. Very good. All right. Let's sing our next song. Uh, Little as much when God is in. I think it's on page five thirty-two. If you want to look in your hymn books.
first verse of this next song. myself, but it is, you know, never know where the Bible is to talk about retirement. You don't ever retire as a Christian. You never do. So it talks about this. It says, to the place you're called, the labor seems so small and little known. It is great if God is in it, and he'll not forget his own. And there you laid aside for service, body worn from toil and care. So I mean, you can't do as much as I can anymore. You can still be in the battle. 
What's it say? In the sacred place of prayer. So we all still got a part. We all still got a part. And um, it's a real, it's a real affirmation for all of us to, as they would say, keep on keeping on. And working, working towards our goal, which is uh, getting to heaven. It's family altar time if you'd like to come forward and, um, and um, pray. We're going to be singing Change My Heart, O oh God. And we're going to have the uh, instruments. My husband's play for us one first time. It says this, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the people of all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so I may be fiercely made known the mysteries of the gospel. This morning, as we go to prayer, that is what we all can be praying for one another that we would be strong in the Lord. And that too, that we just pray as God leads us, as God guides us. It says all kinds of prayers. And as I was just kneeling there, I was thinking of intercession. How Moses on the mountain had to intercede so God would not, because God was angry with what was happening down there. Really? You know the commandments. What are you doing? <laughs> and, you know, he's struggling. Moses is struggling. And he intercedes on our behalf. And I'm thankful for that. And there are times that we can intercede on behalf of others who maybe are doing the 
wrong thing? Instead of complaining about what they're doing, <laughs> this is where God took me. Instead of complaining about what's going on, pray. How easy, right? It's easy to get caught up in all of the stuff that's happening and start complaining about it and being part of, as somebody said to me once when I was working in IT, I mean, complaining so much that you're part of the problem now instead of trying to fix the problem. And so this morning, as we go to prayer, I'm going to guide us as we do some of the praying. There are a lot of things that have come our way, a lot of different things that are going on in people's lives. And so let's go to the Lord, interceding on the behalf of others, and just talking to Him. Let's pray. Father, I am so thankful that I can come, that we can come, into your presence and share these things with you. You invite us to. You call us to. And we heard these words from the Apostle Paul to pray even for him. And we pray for those that are our leaders. We pray for those that are out there doing hard work. And Lord, we pray for those that are dealing with all kinds of situations. And so right now, Lord, we, your people, pray for those facing surgery. Various people come to each of our minds, and so let's just take a moment and pray for those that we know that are facing surgery this coming week. And Lord, then we pray for for those who have been lost in plane crashes this week. And we ask for your comfort for the families and for the communities that have been affected. those of us who have opportunity to comfort and to support, would you help us this week as we do that? And then, Father, there are those who are dealing with sickness, and so we lift them to you right now. As we think and as you bring those names to us, help us as we lift them to you right now. Then, Father, you know our lives, the things that go on at work, that go on at home, the struggles that we all face. And Lord, it's overwhelming many times. Help us as we lift those to you right now. Thank you, Spirit, for interceding on our behalf. Because sometimes we don't know what to say or how to say it. Lord, and there are those that just come to our mind. And we lift them to you right now. In the various situations that each deal with. And I thank you, Father, that we've been able to do that. To bring these needs to you. And so... We have brought them to you, and now we take our hands off of them. We lay them at your feet. For you care even better than we do about these needs. And I ask that you would help us as we focus now on you and allow you to be our focus. Not the things of this world or the things that are pressing, it seems, but we quiet ourselves 
take a deep breath of you. And we look to you now, the author and perfecter of it all. Thank you. Help us as we listen to you in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. You may be seated.
um, is a place you call to labor seems so small and little known. And Jerry and Dar's dad worked at a lot of places that were small and little known. Anybody here ever heard of Prospect, Oregon? Yeah, some people have, but it's pretty small and little known out in the middle of nowhere. And there were other places, but for all of us, there's a place where God sent us to serve. Just do not forget that. people remember going down to the water and skipping rocks. I love that. I wish we could do it more often. Um, in fact, one of the things maybe I'll have to do is when I get out to family camp, just go over there to Eagle Beach, go down a little too far. Maybe I'll do it beforehand. I don't know. Maybe because that's just I missed the road. Whatever. But the thing is, getting out there and skipping a rock. And have you ever noticed what happens when you throw or skip a rock? There's all kinds of ripples that happen with the water. I've always been mesmerized by that. And just see how it goes and ripples out. There is a kind of ripple effect that also has been common in the last, oh, probably 30 years. And it goes back a little bit farther and so forth. But it's called random acts of kindness. You know what that is? Yeah? Basically, it's, you know, paying for the McDonald's up front of you or behind you. It's basically doing various things, maybe paying for somebody's food. Maybe it's doing something special. Maybe it's just a smile to somebody who's having. And it's amazing how one random act will change and have a ripple effect throughout it all. And I think that is important for us to catch, for today's scripture teaches us how important it is for us to do that, to have a ripple effect in our culture and so forth. It happens when we tell our stories to others, especially to those closest to us. I want us to take our Bibles and turn into the Gospel of John and look at chapter 1. And we're going to just look at a few verses, starting with verse 35. So John, chapter 1, verses 35 through 42. And would you please stand and follow along in honor of God's word. The word of the Lord for us today. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? Well, probably not in that tone. <laughs> they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they came and went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. Father, use these words, please, in each of our lives and help us to see today the ripple effects that we can have for good in our world as we share you and how you have changed our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let's take a look at the life of Andrew, because Andrew is important for us to catch. 
we may not have much in regard to Andrew. In fact, he's almost always mentioned as Simon's brother. Any of you been known for your sibling? Or <laughs> siblings, right? <laughs> or whatever. Now, I was the oldest kid, so, you know, everybody, no. My poor sister actually hated it for years, and now she's happy because she's the one who's known and not me so much in regard to Alaska. But it's interesting how Andrew was one of the very first two. There were two people who started following Jesus, and his claim to fame is one of the two. Now, what's interesting is how he spent time with John the Baptist and heard all kinds of things, had learned and had repented and had changed his, his bearing. And he was looking for the Messiah. And he realized, after John pointed him, John pointed Andrew and the other disciple to, to Jesus, that they then followed. And it's interesting how they heard and followed. Now, the crazy thing is, as I said, and then the first thing he did, the very first thing he did, is he went and found his brother. Ever done something like that? Where you found something great and you just had to go? And tell. In fact, I could have, I sort of thought, hmm, what's the birth order here? Is Andrew older or is he younger? Well, let me give you a little bit of insight. I think he was younger, mostly because it's Simon Peter, brother. You know, Andrew is known only because of Simon Peter. And not only that, it's Simon Peter was the boat captain. In fact, he probably doesn't. Their father probably has passed away. And mom may be gone too. It's just like it's just the two of them left. We know that sort of because when you get to James and John, it's the sons of Zebedee, and they were out with their father fishing. So that speculation, mind you, but I want you to understand the whole situation. Get a sort of feel for Andrew. So he probably is... Helping his brother. His brother was also known as being, you know, a loudmouth, getting himself into trouble, and so forth. Anybody who's seen The Chosen sort of get a picture, and I think it's a great job. I realize it's not scriptural. Please understand it. But I think they do a great job depicting the situation between the brothers. I think, though, they're probably, we were talking earlier um, out in the hallway during Sunday school about sibling rivalries and how easy that is, especially when you're young, right? You know about that, the sibling rivalries? When you get a little older, you're, there's not as much, hopefully. Hopefully you grow out of that. But in that, there is going, oh, and I wonder how Andrew felt. He's one of the first ones. He finds, but then he goes and he finds his brother. And his brother becomes somebody of importance. In fact, his brother becomes the head of the church. It's like, why? But he still shared that experience with his brother. He, he had to let him know, maybe because, hey, I've seen my brother struggle with this very thing. I'm looking for the Christ. I'm waiting for the Messiah. And he says, we found him finally. Of course, his brother's probably a little bit, ah, yeah, right. Mm -hmm, kid, we get it. We don't know what Simon's first reaction is to his meeting with Peter. We do not understand what Peter, well, excuse me, with Jesus. We don't know how that took place. I want to, this is the first time. This is the very first time that Peter gets to know Jesus. Now, how it all occurred, I don't know. I tend to have my own timeline. I don't think he followed right away. I think it doesn't happen until he's in the boat with all those fish. And he lays down, I mean, 
he's catching on that Jesus is somebody special. But it is when that boat is capsizing and he realizes, oh my, oh my, oh my. I am in the midst of God. And there is this going, Lord, get away from me. I am not worthy to have you around me. I think at that point, and then Jesus saying, come, follow me, that Peter finally relinquishes control and says yes to the Lord. And that is so powerful for us to catch that it does change. Peter changes because Andrew was willing to do what was necessary to help. See, Andrew was a connector. He was a social connector. He was one of those people who just constantly helped people get closer to Jesus. He, we probably would say he's a good networker. He knew exactly who needed to see who and get things done. He wasn't that prominent. He probably was maybe even a social butterfly. I don't know. I don't get exactly how he is, but he has an important role because he constantly brings people to Jesus. Remember? In John chapter 6, there's a story of the feeding of the 5,000. 6 verse 8 talks about what happens. Is Philip is asked by Jesus, hey, we got to feed all these people. And Philip says, are you kidding me, Jesus? Do you realize how much it's going to take? There's no way we'd have the money. And Andrew comes along, and he says, hey, I found a little boy with some fish and bread. But Jesus, is that enough? We can't do it. But is it? There's almost this question, and it is in that connecting that we have the feeding of the 5,000. Andrew is the one who made that possible. He's the one who made it possible for Peter to be part of the group. And then we have one other time. Towards the end of Jesus' ministry, he's talking there, and he's been intermingling with the Jews and so forth, and there is a statement that's made that a bunch of Greeks wanted, wanted desperately to see Jesus. And so what he did was to, they went to um, Philip. Philip was, at least had a name that was Greek. And so they came to him, expecting him to help. And I think he was a little intimidated, because it's not until Andrew comes along and says, hey, let's take them, or let's go talk to Jesus. Come on, let's go talk to Jesus. And so they come to Jesus, and they tell Jesus about these Greeks. And at that point, Jesus goes on to his spiel and saying, now the Son of Man is glorified, and now all this must happen. So Andrew is a key turning point, and yet he is often ignored. He's somebody else's brother. <sighs> it doesn't matter to him. Because what's so key is him connecting people with Jesus. He wants people to know this God that he's found. It is so key for us to see that. This is the part that I love about Andrew. And the first lesson that we can learn is that he took a risk. He and John... But I think it was more Andrew took the risk to go and follow Jesus. He goes there. And, he, and Jesus says, come and see. Come and see. See. You know, walk along with me. Let's talk. We have to take that risk. There's a lot of questions. And it starts off, hear this. He starts calling him first rabbi. 
teacher. Somebody of importance. I mean, there were lots of rabbis. But it's interesting that when he's done, he does not call a rabbi anymore. In fact, maybe, maybe, the very first admission of who Jesus was being the Christ, the Messiah. Now, I don't think he understood that, what it all meant. But the very first profession of that is not by Simon Peter. It says here, we found the Messiah. We found the Christ. Wow. I mean, that is a pretty profound statement made by Andrew. And so he has taken the risk to get to know Jesus, and he's found Jesus to be worthy. And so he tells people about it. See, because he doesn't keep it to himself. You know, that was a kind of rough thing to go through. If all of a sudden he's just talking, and he's freely saying this, do you realize the risk? Because he could be called a heretic. Oh, Jesus is already sort of known, and people are worried about him. But now he's associating himself with it, with Jesus. And so he shares with others, of course, the closest people to him. And that should be how we all feel. We should want the people closest to us to get to know this Jesus. I'll tell you this. When I decided to marry Donna, I said, you know, I'll wait till, uh, you know, next week. You know? I had to wait till the next morning because it was already midnight. And I know that I had, but I couldn't keep it to myself. Donna did, but not me. I couldn't keep it to myself. I just had to tell people. I just had to say, hey, guess what? She said, yes. You know, it was one of those things. I just, and you want to tell the people closest to you. You want to get this to be known to others. What's amazing, too, is that Andrew did one of the greatest of all things. He kept connecting people. And that is our job, connecting people with Jesus. Keep telling people about Jesus. Just through our lives, our stories, we don't have to understand all of it. We don't have to even truly grasp it entirely. But we should tell people of how Jesus is making a difference in my life. And it may not be perfect. You know, the biggest thing that keeps any of us from sharing the truth is because, guess what? I just don't have it down right. You know? I'm just a terrible friend. I just, you know? No. That's got to stop. We share what we have. Andrew didn't understand everything he, about Jesus. None of them did. It wasn't until Jesus died and rose again that they began to comprehend Understand something. God came down. That had never happened. Understand their situation. This is unique. This has never occurred before. And it has now. They were witnesses to the greatest of all truths, greatest of all miracles, the greatest of all events in all of human history. God came down and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the one and only. And what a great good news for us. God loves us and is taking care of And our job is to connect people with that truth. We may not have it all. That's okay. Share it anyways. You don't have to grasp it all. How do we do this? We do it by being vulnerable. Have to be vulnerable. If we see one thing in regard to Andrew, he was vulnerable. He, he, it, 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 I can't say it any better than that. But there's also authentic. We do it by being authentic. We share. I think I have found. And it's a matter of, I know I have found. And it's a matter of us 
being authentic with people, sharing where we're at. And it's also the understanding that I may, and it's interesting because I think Andrew caught what John the Baptist had said. I must decrease in order that he might increase. Okay. And Andrew had to realize that he had to decrease so that his brother was quite, quite the powerful man, oh. often spoke way before he should, but a powerful man in himself could lead people <coughs> so that Andrew had to decrease so his brother could increase. And then he would be known, not as the first disciple, but as the brother of Simon Peter. <clears throat> That's hard. See, because he realized he needed to be helpful, not look at me. Look at what I'm doing. Yes, I am something. Um, see, coming down to the end now, we all cause ripples. Okay? We all cause ripples of some kind. How many people have been out in a canoe or in a kayak and then some, I'll be kind, some person decides to speed by in their boat right beside us? What happens? <laughs> if you are not going into the wake, what's happening? Worst case scenario, you're flipped over. You, you're waterlogged. You're, and you're ready to just... Let that guy have, right? Do you realize sometimes our ripples can be that? We have to be careful. We really truly have to be careful as people because we do cause ripples. Every one of us, every day, cause ripples. But there are good ripples that we can do. Tuesday, I got to be involved in one of those. We may never see the consequences of the ripples we cause, but one of the things that's happening now on about every six weeks on Tuesday is there is a, it happens for all the churches here on the loop, six of the churches on the loop here, do a, a canteen, a caring canteen it's called, over there. I have been told many times I get it all mixed up around here. I want to say that's downtown Jim Hill. It's over there. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> Fingers don't always go in the right direction. I may get turned around. But the Karen Canteen is helping people. We may not realize the, the ripple effect, but we're causing ripples. We're causing things to happen for people's lives. And it is not causing a boat to capsize because somebody went speeding by and couldn't, couldn't care less about the person in the canoe or the, the kayak. <coughs> we need to make sure that we're doing, that we're sharing Jesus. The last slide explains what we need to put into practice this week. We need to go and share how Jesus impacted our lives and make a positive ripple effect wherever we go. I want that to be, as Pastor Mike would say, your homework. <laughs> Is that we go out and we make <coughs> positive ripples. Especially for Jesus. And trust me, whether you mention the name of Jesus or not, people will know whether you are a Christian or not. They can see. And sometimes then they can go, oh, a Christian does that? And it causes a bad ripple. 
Or we can say, hey, I'm human and I need Christ. And when we say it that way, because we will all, I was sharing earlier, we will all fail. Every single one of us will fail. Okay? The truth of the matter is, is that when we fail, we admit that we failed and that he is greater than us. And we keep pointing to him. It's how we are growing that is the ripple effect. How we share with others around us. So this week, let's go and share how Jesus has impacted our lives. And allow that to be a ripple effect to all that we come in contact with. Let's pray. Father God, this morning... You have challenged me. Yeah. You have challenged us mm -hmm. to go and cause some waves. But waves that are positive. <clears throat> ripples that share your love with people and that lives are changed. That as we share with those around us that we can see you at work because we allow you to work through us. Guide us, please, Lord Jesus, and empower us by your spirit to go and live the life that you called us to. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in the power of the spirit, knowing he is indeed going to use you this very day. Got it.